Welcome, welcome one and all to uh, this Social Liberal Forum event on what kind of UBI. Uh, we are, uh, we've got a very big, uh, very big attendance for, a, for an issue that is uh, very close to the party's heart right now and, and, and is a key thing for us to work, be working on going forward after what has been a I think ultimately a very very positive set of local elections last week and local not just local but uh for scottish and welsh uh scottish parliament and welsh senate elections and um, um among other people this evening we're very very pleased and proud to have jane dodds our new uh member of the senate among us so i'll give jane a sort of mini uh mini round of applause from here um uh, congratulations and well done uh folks this evening, I'm just I'm just going to keep talking for a minute because the participant numbers are still coming through. When when you have a meeting this large, it takes Zoom a minute or two to to allow everyone in. So I'm just going to let people let people keep arriving for another moment, uh, and then we will get started. I think the I think the numbers have, have slowed down a little bit, so I think we will we will parling. So we've got a lot to get through this evening. So uh, welcome again, everyone. Uh, my name's John Alexander. I'm uh, not chair of the Social Liberal Forum, but I am chair of this evening's event. Uh, I'm a I'm a council member at the Social Liberal Forum, and I'm also the founder of a, of a consultancy called the New Citizenship Project, and 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 work and have been working very closely off the back of some of that work. With, uh, with Ian Kearns, the director of uh, the Social Liberal Forum, on our Citizens Britain agenda that some of you will have, uh, will have come across. And, and both Ian and I are, are keen advocates of, of, of universal basic income within that within broader agenda, but also as a, on, on its own terms. I'm very proud, therefore, to be hosting uh, the event this evening. Uh, and, and one of the, the, the bits of language that, that, that really resonates with me and, and, and the moment that really turned me on to both the Citizens Britain agenda and on to universal basic income was in Paddy's book, Paddy Ashdown's book, Citizens Britain uh, of 1989, he, uh, he, he talks about basic income, he talks about a citizen's income in fact, and, and, and he used the very powerful phrase that every step we take towards a basic income will liberate power in the hands of the citizen. And that's, uh, that I think is a really lovely frame for us to, to start from this evening as we take, as the party takes another step towards a basic income and as we uh, are all part of that conversation together. So the function of this evening is, is really primarily about uh, launching a consultation phase or, or now, now pre-launching a consultation phase, um, as Paul will say a bit more about. Uh, the, the party uh, entered a formal policy working group uh, uh, in the aftermath of autumn conference last year when, when universal basic income was adopted as party policy. Paul Noblet, who's with us this evening, has been the chair of that group. Uh, and they now have reached a, a, a set of recommendations or, a, a, as Paul will frame, a, a set of proposals, actually. Uh, and, that, and those proposals will be going out for uh, up for consultation. A, a discussion paper should was supposed to be published on the party website a few days ago, uh, but they decided to make both Paul's life and my life as chair of this event interesting by not quite doing so yet. Uh, so the, that that will go live, but this evening we're going to hear from Paul a kind of sneak preview and 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 give you as attendees of this event the first glance at those fine at those recommendations at those proposals, and get and and start to equip us to as a as a party to discuss those proposals and and feed into them in the best possible way. By hearing some from very from some very well qualified first responders, Jane Dodds, uh, leader of the party in Wales, our newest member of the Senate, uh, and uh, and a, a figurehead and campaigner for for for, for basic income, uh, who's who who I've worked with very closely as part of Lib Dems for basic income. Uh, she and and Andy might be posting a few things in the chat that you can uh, check out a bit more on her. Christine Jardine, who needs no introduction as our Member of Parliament for Edinburgh West, uh, and also our Parliamentary Spokesperson on the Treasury, uh, which is obviously of direct relevance to, to this. And also she is, uh, she is also uh, our, our sort of lead representative on the cross-party parliamentary and local government group, one of the most horrific acronyms I think I've seen in, in all of politics, the CPPP, LG, G, 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 G. So Christine may give us a bit of a view from there. And the third first responder will be Max Guinness, uh, who we are, as the Social Liberal Forum, very proud to have been working with on 
a report that was published, also published today and which formed uh, part of the stimulus that, that Paul and his working group heard from uh, as part, uh, and so Max's report, a blank slate, basically a blank slate UBI, a constructive challenge to the U UK basic income debate was published today and the, the, uh, the, the links to that will be posted in the chat uh, very shortly as well. Before we go any further, I'm just going to pause because uh, as all of us I'm sure know, and any, if anyone who doesn't will find out very, she very soon, uh, we are uh, about to be fighting, the Liberal Democrats are about to be fighting a, a very important by-election and there is a link to the SLF in that as well. So I'm gonna ask Ian Brady brown who is the chair of the Social Liberal Forum, just to say a word or two about that. Ian, you're off camera at the moment, but if you'd like to appear and, and say a word, we'd love to hear from you. John, yes, I just won't take very long. I just want to plug for you uh, the by-election at Chesham and Amersham. Sarah Green was a director of the Social Liberal Forum and is a very good thing. And we ought to be turning out in numbers to support her. So the details are on the SLF Facebook page. They've been emailed to everybody. I think the last time I saw many of you was at the Jane Dodds by election in, uh, in Brecon and Radnor. And I hope to see as many of you in Chesham and Amersham in the few, I don't care if you go to Chesham or Amersham, just get yourself there quickly because we need to get in early on this campaign if we're to change the, narr the political narrative. So that's my bit. Thank you very much. I promise no more than a minute and that's it. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, very well, uh, very well put and, and points well made. Uh, so folks, we're going to get into this without uh, much further ado. Um, just to say the process for this evening, we are uh, largely going to be hearing from Paul and giving you a chance to digest some of those proposals. We've got a poll coming up later. We will be watching uh, Andy, who's here. Andy, just give us a quick wave. Uh, as my, my able assistant, uh, we'll be watching the Q&A and participating a little bit in the chat as well. So use the Q&A if there are questions you'd like to pose uh, of, the, of the party proposals as you, as you hear Paul present them. Uh, and, and we will keep an eye on those, try and bring a few into the conversation uh, and, and, and also feed them through to Paul and the, and the working group as, part, uh, as another sort of angle into the consultation. Uh, um, and, and then, and so, so the process for this evening, we'll hear from Paul, we'll hear each of Jane, Christine and Max uh, give some first responses, and then we'll have a bit of a poll and a bit more of a conversation and maybe bring one or two folk into that. So that's the plan. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I think Paul, uh, so just to introduce Paul, he's an experienced charity professional in policy and public affairs and a long time leader of the party's thinking and policy development in welfare in particular. Uh, having, for example, also chaired the policy working group, which produced a, fair, uh, a fairer share for all policy. He's also a former and I'm sure future council and indeed cabinet member in Southwark. Uh, so, Paul, I think that is over to you. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, I, um, I've just got some slides to share in time honoured fashion. So uh, let me put these uh, on. I hope everyone can see those uh, OK. Um, so, yes, uh, well, as, um, I start by thanking uh, John and everyone at um, Social Liberal Forum for um, putting this uh, event together this evening. Um, uh, as he mentioned, um, it's uh, the working group that I've uh, got the privilege to chair um, came directly off the back of the motion that was passed at the, uh, at the federal conference last September in, in 2020. Um, and it's a really exciting uh, piece of work to do and quite a, uh, you know, and a unique working group, um, I think, because we're at a point where um, uh, usually, when I previously chaired another working group, you're deciding whether something's a good idea and then you also then work out how to, to do it. And the working out of how to do it is often a test of whether it's a good idea. And obviously in this one, we've, we've adopted the principle and now the remit of this working group has very much been to go away and work out how to to implement it. So um, we're a little bit uh, of a different working group, um, but I hope we've been doing good work. And I hope when the consultation paper, which I hope will be out first thing in the morning, and certain, certainly uh, John will be sharing it with everyone and the party will be sharing it uh, too uh, as soon as it comes out. Um, it was largely because someone decided to put a load of elections in the middle of a working group. That's the way I like to think about it anyway. Um, 
So in terms of um, where we've started from, the, the starting point, obviously, and I think it's worth just rehearsing a few of the arguments around why UBI is a good thing. Um, we've started, and this has been very much brought to the fore by the pandemic, that uh, the social security system is broken. It is complex. It is far from generous enough even to meet basic needs. There are horrendous time lags involved, which means not only are people trapped in poverty, but also that income instability that comes with low paid and infrequent work and zero hour contracts makes it impossible to, to plan and that constant stress and impact on mental health and well-being. Um, we reflected in setting up the working group that certainly, uh, let alone um, Beveridge, but certainly definitely not Lord George and Asquith could not have uh, thought as liberal predecessors that we would get to this point when things were just simply so complex. So um, the idea behind UBI, and I'm sure many of the people who are tuned in this evening will be absolutely familiar with this, but for those who are perhaps newer to or UBI curious, as I, I think Leila Moran mentioned in one of the policy hostings being UBI curious, and it was great to see both Leila and Ed advocating this, and obviously um, parliamentarians like Christine picking it up as well um, uh, in the autumn of last year. But it's a, it's a fixed rate payment. It's payable to all, uh, which is fantastic in terms of tackling some of that social stigma that there is around much of the benefit system. Um, it's crucially also an individual benefit and not a household one. And giving that sense of agency as Liberal Democrats, we believe in the individual. And that's a, an ethos and an ideology, but it's also very practical um, benefits of having an individual rather than a household benefit particularly in instances around domestic abuse, for example, at one extreme, is that actually there's quite a lot of evidence now that UBI actually can do that because it can offer people a practical way out. And, and people in that situation, obviously, there is a pra huge practical support around that and about getting that money quickly and knowing it's coming. So that's one of the more practical uh, elements um, just to pick out, I think. I've touched on the mental health and well-being, certainly the studies in California, in parts of Canada, in Finland most recently, um, have shown that the impact on people's health and well-being is really positive. And I think we can't think when talking about public spending in the round about the impact actually not only to benefit individuals, but also to tackle public spending in other areas and potentially free it up from mental health services and the NHS at large by not causing those problems in the first place. Again, shouldn't be underestimated when we're thinking about funding this in, in the round. Um, it's also, uh, and many people have talked about this in the past, is around volunteering and people not only having a sense of agency around their time uh, and tackling some of those issues around zero hour contracts, but it also allows people to have the value of what they do in their spare time up and down all of our communities. But there's also an element in terms of the sort of the economy that we do measure, putting aside that we're not very good at measuring perhaps all of the benefits that people give through their labour. Um, and that's through, um, it allows people the ability to not necessarily take the first job that comes up. It can actually be looking and tying this more into where do we have skills gap? How can we uh, match the geography, how can we, to use the phrase level up, make sure that we are spending other bits of public money in the right places, but how are we also meeting people's aspirations and their talents and making sure that people are not only um, uh, achieving what they want to, but also, uh, of course, contributing um, to the economy at, at large. Um, and it also gives people the space, as many people have done during the pandemic, which is to to retrain and to take a chance on setting up business because actually you know you've got that cash flow and for so many people whether it's making ends meet which would be a fantastic point for us to get to in this country for many many people but it's also that driver of the small businesses which uh, again so many of our parliamentarians and councillors and members of the senate and the scottish parliament have talked about uh, so much over over recent months so there's there's very practical elements of ubi um, but there's also, I think, at base, and we shouldn't get too far away from this, 
is it's a way of thinking about society and it's a way of thinking about how people um, fit in or rather that it's about making sure that people don't have to conform and that they're not uh, kept down by, by poverty or as it were, ignorance in terms of not being able to get those new skills. It's giving people agency, but I think in a very practical grassroots way that as a party we're so well known for. So um, I'll, I'll move the slide on because I'm, I'm sure after seven minutes you're sick of looking at just one. Um, so um, the um, so to kind of go into briefly the working group remit. So John touched on this a bit, and um, I thank Federal Policy Committee for I think being very clear and I think helping us with a steer based on the motion that was passed at conference. Um, uh, critically, it's around developing costed proposals and it's got to be practical and deliverable. And I think that was a really important thing because I think when we've all advocated for UBI in the past, we've maybe talked more about the ethos than the nuts and bolts and we'll come on to the costs later on. Um, but we also need to make sure that funding is done in a, a socially just and equitable manner to, to create a fairer social security system, to fix that broken system, to get rid of us uh, having almost just adopted food banks as a thing that just exists and we should make sure run really well whereas perhaps we need to again to get back to thinking it's brilliant that they're there but should they exist at all the second point was to again really critical and when I've talked about issues like um, uh, enabling people to gain new skills around lifelong learning around having the opportunity to start a new business um, they're things that part the parties have policy on for a long time and we're committed to funding. So again, it's about drawing a balance in an overall manifesto between how much do we spend on a UBI, on universal credit and all the benefit system versus how much do we want to put into lifelong learning uh, skills wallets to give a blast from the past for the last uh, 2019 general election. Um, but also make sure that whatever we do is that in potentially changing a system, we don't end up with vulnerable people in particular losing out because of quirks in the in the system and certainly that's something when we took evidence from max for example that we'll hear from later uh he, he's got some interesting views on how we make that that balance and put in those those safeguards so um uh we touched on on um sort of um existing party policy uh, as john said i chaired um uh, a fair share for all uh many of which the policies from that 20 uh, September 28, uh, 2018 policy paper uh, found their way into the 2019 manifesto. That was the catchy paying universal credit in five days rather than five weeks, which obviously speaks to that um, cash flow issue that so many people have. But it also had things that were uh, really quite radical. And I think even, even you know, Labour and potentially even the Greens were not calling for around uh, tackling and indeed abolishing the current sanction system, which has done so much, particularly around people with disabilities, but also um, uh, the impact on people with mental health of, of constantly having to justify that they're searching for work often when people are just not able to. Um, but also reversing some of the things that, that, that um, happened during the coalition in terms of um, the benefits cap, but also looking to, to tackle the two child limit, which of course was brought in as soon as we were not there to keep an eye on the Conservatives. And obviously, alongside that, we've obviously got long-standing policies to really try and tackle some of the complete injustices, particularly of the last five or six years that have been handed down to, to people who, um, again, to disabled people, uh, but also to try and support much better uh, people um, uh, who, who care for others. Um, in terms of moving on to kind of the UBI and what we've been um, uh, looking at and, and I'll maybe just go into some of the discussions here at this point as well so a lot of what's looked into and again maxi paper is slightly different on this one but I think does make a number of, of good points um, is that because of the complexity and the extra support that uh, disabled people can need and those who care for them um, but also around the massive uh, divergences in the cost of housing across the United Kingdom um, those are two sets of benefits that we almost immediately took out of the system because there's such variations that those as means tested benefit, uh, benefits would need to stay in the system, uh, stay separate from a UBI. Um, 
We also have looked at child benefits and whether you started a UBI almost at zero, but just at a slightly lower rate. Uh, but we think on balance, the current system, if you remove the two child limit, uh, uh, works pretty well in the first instance. And equally, pensions uh, obviously is a universal uh, benefit uh, to those who've reached uh, um, uh, various ages. There's obviously there's various points of transition depending on your age now. Um, and uh, certainly around the issue of pensions, uh, a discussion, and I'd be interested to hear people's feedback on this, is whether or not, if obviously a UBI was introduced, there would be a cost to it, but whether or not there is something we want to look at as a party in terms of removing the sort of household approach to uh, pensions, where obviously a pension couple effectively get one and a half times uh, a pension rather than two individual pensions if they're living uh, as a couple. Um, I think just to touch on, on kind of who is in the group as people, as obviously there are lots of people, many of whom are far more uh, academic and expert and handy with modeling than I am. Um, uh, it's been a really good group for having a balance of uh, obviously people who all care deeply about tackling um, some of the social inequities that the current benefit system has in it, but it has a range of people, some of whom were perhaps keener on the UBI motion than others that was passed. And, and that's been really good to have that process of challenge internally in the group. Um, it's also been a group that we have really worked to make sure there are representation from uh, each of the uh, three nations of Great Britain. So it's been fantastic um, uh, through that actually to hear from things like UBI Lab Wales, but also to hear Scottish perspectives as well as uh, uh, both from the north of England, the Midlands, and uh, uh, somewhat inevitably, many of you would say, well, from southern England. Um, so it's been a real mixture and has given us a real sense of what the perspectives are from those different parts. Um, the discussion has been robust but positive. We've met about on average every three weeks for about the last three months. It's been a really compressed period of, of time. Um, lots of different modeling has been done and we've heard lots of evidence including as I say from Max but also from uh, a couple of real leading proponents on this issue who've worked on this issue for uh, multiple decades in some cases uh, Malcolm Torrey and Howard Reed. Howard Reed was one of the authors of a paper that was done for Compass and Compass obviously have done quite a lot of work with uh, SLF over the years and trying to build some cross-party support for this and I know many of our, our parliamentarians and councillors at different levels also have worked cross-party on this issue. We also heard from Nick Pierce, who from the Institute of Policy Research, who is obviously a former uh, Labour uh, special advisor. So again, we've tried to get ideas from across the spectrum, but we've also tried to hear from voices within the party as well. And uh, this evening's event is, is really an extension of, of that. Um, so um, have, having teased people with where we've got to with the model, um, here comes the sort of details, and I'm apologies that the, my uh, formatting has gone slightly wrong. So uh, uh, please do bear with me, but I will talk you through it. So as John mentioned, we, we've kind of looked at um, four points in the consultation document, sort of four price points, um, levels of UBI, uh, 45 pounds, 60 pounds, 75 and 95 pounds uh, per week. And how we're envisaging it running is and this is very much a start and an initial step and in what we think is both logistically and potentially fundable, but also we have to obviously have an eye on the politics of this as well, because there's no point everyone thinking it's a good idea and then having no seats in any, uh, in any institution of the uh, United Kingdom in order to ever implement it. So uh, to take the example, um, you know, someone uh, receiving £94 a week, so the, so the sort of adult uh, basic standard allowance under universal credit, would be given uh, 60 pounds UBI. Uh, the basic income would not be taxable, but it would be classified as income for the purposes of means testing the universal credit. Obviously, crucially, that means testing, those benefits would be paid in five days, not five weeks, and there wouldn't be the same conditionality regime, particularly the sanctions around them. So we felt that where we were starting from as a party in terms of that universal credit system allied with a UBI could be a good first step on the road it would result uh, in this particular example of a £60 level of UBI uh, with a total income of £116.20. So, you know, you're talking about 20 quid a week uh, extra. Um, 
it's not going to end poverty overnight. And I think that's something we've really been very clear as of a party is if you want to get to that sort of level, um, there is a considerable price tag um, uh, that goes along with that. But we think it's progressive. We think um, particularly uh, uh, what we can do is, is make it as distributionally progressive as possible. And I think it's something that parties should be really, really proud of was how much the 2019 manifesto was rated so highly by the Institute for Fiscal Studies in terms of how progressive it was, particularly for uh, uh, households in that case, at the lower end of the income spectrum. So how can we fund it? Well, all the way we've, we've looked at it and around the modeling has been based around income tax. There are other ways you can look at it. Um, we can look at, you know, in the longer term, something like a, a one-off wealth tax or a multi-year wealth tax, something that sets up, sets up effectively an endowment. But we focus for the purposes of this consultation on personal um, income tax allowances, national insurance uh, primary thresholds, uh, and of course, ultimately, uh, how many pence in the pound people are paying, <clears throat> excuse me, at different uh, income levels. Um, we've kept in some of the personal allowance. Obviously, for the party, there is a almost a kind of sort of totemic issue, having fought so hard in coalition to raise the personal tax allowance. This obviously reduces this down. The reason we've kept it uh, at two and a half thousand pounds or thereabouts and 50 pounds for the national insurance primary threshold is it does make sure that we get as few as possible uh, losers through little quirks of the way it would interact with universal credit. And it would be something in the implementation we would need to make sure we were looking at the universal credit side as well to make sure that we met that crucial third criteria set down by the Federal Policy Committee uh, around making sure that nobody else would be worse off under this new sort of hybrid system. Even taking into account those changes to uh, national uh, insurance and to income tax thresholds, um, there is still a funding gap. And this would be where we would have to look at increasing levels of, of income tax at the basic, the sort of medium and the higher rates. And we would obviously look to do that in terms of the burden falling on the broadest shoulders. And this starts to give you an idea. It's very much in line with the work that um, people, as I say, like Malcolm Torrey and Howard Reed, when he was doing the work for Compass, have come up, which is which to say, in terms of bridging the gap per year, we would need to look at as much as 18 billion to give a 45 pounds a week. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, it goes up further and further. Um, as I say, there are other ways of tackling this. There are other taxes you can raise, but we very much try to use as an illustration uh, uh, income tax, as it's also much the simplest way to try and uh, model these things. Uh, and that was said by lots of people who were used to modeling a lot of things as accountants and those other professions on the working group. Um, I think it's crucial to say that the working group in, in talking about this, um, we, we, and we think the party are, for the longer term, we aspire to getting to a point where effectively we could get to a UBI level where most means tested benefits come out as much as they practically can. There's probably a discussion still to be had around benefits for uh, disabled people and around housing costs because there just is that level of complexity that it's very difficult to give a universal benefit to. But it, we think it's one that could be implemented quickly. We think from the evidence we've taken within two years of a majority or government certainly in which we had a very large say. Um, and crucially, it's something that we will need to phase in. We all know that even before the pandemic, there was an uncertainty approaching in terms of the world of work, in terms of how many hours, in terms of automation, in terms of all those issues we're, we're aware of. So we need, we felt, to do this in a staged manner and to see some of the macroeconomic consequences of bringing in a UBI uh, in tandem initially with a more generous and more efficient universal credit system uh, and frankly a kinder universal credit system as well. Um, the party would need to look down the road and as much as I'm loath to even tie us down for, another, for the next manifesto, uh, we certainly shouldn't be tying ourselves down to a manifesto or two down the road. So 
Um, we sort of just want to, I think, make the point, and it says in the consultation, and there is effectively a question in the consultation which says, have we gone a bit too far with this? Should we have gone further? Should we go further in time if you're comfortable with where we've got to as a result of this, this paper? But particularly uh, the flavour coming back from some of our colleagues in, in Scotland, in Wales, where obviously we've seen already, if you campaign on UBI, you can win on UBI, but also in many Northern council areas where we've had a number of um, people involved in councils, uh, both trying to win seats and currently holding seats and retaining seats uh, last week, who said, you cannot underestimate the level of support for actually this sort of thing on the doorstep because people are sick and tired of seeing food banks. People are sick and tired of actually as many people who are perhaps on slightly higher incomes than thought they would ever need to rely on benefits found you're never very far away from potentially falling into this problem. So there's a great deal of support, but also from places like London and some of our other major cities, there's real feedback as well that this could be a positive thing. So the compulsory final slide, as John touched on, we are about to start a consultation. I'm afraid it's a short consultation or shorter than I'd hoped, um, largely because Federal Conference Committee have brought forward the deadline for motions. So we've got about three fewer weeks than we thought we had, even when we thought we didn't have enough time in the first place. So um, I'm, I'm sorry to everyone to sort of jump this, uh, jump this onto people uh, just after a very long set of campaigns that most people had elections. Um, but what we're trying to do, and I've been talking to, to colleagues at Great George Street about this, is to um, make this uh, as user friendly as possible. So with an event like this, we're trying to do a sort of a officially party sanctioned one, probably in the early 20 somethings of this month. And obviously we want to get an email out to members, which will have a, a sort of set of simpler questions, which people can just fill in those 10, rather than maybe going through some of the sort of more of a mix of simple and more technical questions where we've put in the consultation document. And obviously we're aiming to, um, to, to, to get this to federal conference in uh, September with one final proposal, having heard what, what members this evening and members more broadly um, have to say. So um, with thanks not only to my colleagues on the working group, I know many have tuned in this evening to, to watch this, uh, so I hope I've done them justice, um, but also with thanks to, to John and the team at Social Liberal Forum. Um, I will leave it there, having gone about four minutes over time, John. So uh, forgive me for that. I will stop sharing my screen and hand back to you. No, I think it was very helpful to, to spend some time in it, particularly as we haven't had the chance to sort of actually read, too many of us haven't had the chance to actually read the paper yet. Just to be really clear, Paul, so you're, you're saying you've modelled four different points and you are looking for, and the consultation is looking for feedback at, at, on sort of, all aspects of this and 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 particularly sort of a steer to, as to sort of which of those levels because i mean there, there's some comments in the chat about being feeling like it's some of the levels are quite timid and you're and you're talking but 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 from 45 to 95 is quite a significant difference and you've modeled all four of those is that right uh, in essence yes and it was remiss of me to sort of um uh to, yes to ask what would be I, I guess most useful although um as a very um a democratic party people can absolutely decide what they think is the most useful thing to feed back um I, yeah i mean you know listen yeah. we, we we really agonized about what was the lowest we could possibly put forward and 45 pounds i think to some people in the group and obviously i have to kind of um as chair kind of try and bridge some of those gaps and not dominate with my own views but we felt the 45 pounds if you add it to universal credit you're by the time you've done the tapering you're not really getting much higher but you're still obviously having to find you know in the mid-teens of billions to fund it so it feels like a lot of money just to pay for a for a name i suppose the 60 pound felt like it might well be a starting point and that a lot of members might say okay now we're getting going and with our sort of political heads on as well i can sell that on the doorstep for many other people 95 pounds might be where they want to go but then we really have to start looking at what do you not spend on you know obviously when it comes to colleagues bringing together the manifesto in two years three years how many years it is they need to work out how do you fund all the other things we want to do be it child care be it social care and all of those other things so but but as I say, it's it, there will be a question. There is a question in in the document when it goes live, which is to say, we want to phase this in because we think it's practical. We're a party based on the data 
and on seeing what works. And um, you know, if the if the, if the party says seventy five pounds is the way to start, we will we will make that work. Um, and I think for many many in the group, um, people um, were well. If we can actually get to double that within five years, if we're talking about a Liberal Democrat majority government in 2024 or 2029, could you in a decade get to a higher level and got rid of means tested benefits? So, you know, I think people have been through a range of emotions. There are people who I think interpreted the motion at conference as, right, we're off and running, we'll scrap means tested benefits immediately and we can just do this. And I think everybody probably deep down wants to do that. We, we want to tackle poverty. We want to give people that individual agency and all of that freedom that comes with it and do it on an individual rather than a household basis. But economically, we might be able to get there politically. My own personal view is it's a, it's a hard sell. Right. And I think it probably comes from the, the, the motion at conference, fantastic step in the right direction, but it, one of the things we've had to try and do, and I think the consultations a vital part of that is trying to actually read the tea leaves and find out what exactly was it that everybody voted for. Um, and I think the consultation process hopefully will tell us that. And as I can sort of now see the chat more clearly now, I've stopped sharing slides. Um, I'm getting a bit of a sense of a, of a range of opinions. So, uh, that, and that's fantastic. That's how it should be. Great, thank you, Paul. And what we're going to do, actually, if I can, if Andy can help me, we're going to, uh, while we hear from our first responders and, and see what Jane and, and Christine and Max uh, make of what they've heard, and, and we did actually manage to give them a sneak preview of the documents, they had they had a little bit of thinking time. Um, we, Andy, if you could launch the poll as well. Uh, so we've got four four quick questions. These are not sort of the formal consultation questions. Don't we? Um, and like your 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 views won't 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 be held you won't be held to them you can also respond to the consultation once it goes live but this is just a, a chance to sort of get a sense of of, of how your fellow uh, your fellow attendees are, are feeling about things feel free to answer now or as as you hear from 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 our three first responders so jane would you like to come into the conversation and and uh, and tell us a bit about where you're at, and, what, and I gather we gather you've uh, you feel you've basically you've basically done enough to be able to retire as an MS already, from what we gather. So your 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 first your first responses, Thanks. if you would. Thanks very much, Dechwari, and everybody. Um, so a huge thank you to Paul and the group. It is not easy to do this work um, because um, not everybody agrees and some people will disagree, but really we've got to start somewhere and this is where we are. So this is really encouraging. And it's great that there are, there are discussions and debates going on on universal basic income, which a year ago, this party did not have that policy. I have two dates in my mind where I went, where I, where I let out a huge yelp one of them was that I was allowed to let out, let out that Yelp, which was on the 24th of September when we passed the policy on UBI. And I did wake up the house when I leapt up, when we got the votes in. Uh, the second time was yesterday when I was sitting in the Senate. That wasn't allowed Yelp. I had to do a little internal one, which is when Mark Drakeford, the first minister, announced that he was going to look at how Wales could introduce a universal basic income. So we have pushed this debate forward. The Liberal Democrats have done this. We have pushed this debate forward and we should be proud of that. Now there will be different views, but this is where the discussion starts. And it's great that we've got 121 people here on this discussion and we'll be having more, I'm sure, in the consultation. So some real positives. I'm really uh, pleased to see that uh, means to additional benefits such as housing, and those uh, for people with additional needs are out of this because that's exactly what I think. Uh, we, need to take, uh, we need to take those additional issues where they vary so significantly according to people's needs and, and where they live. This is out of it and it, it simplifies it for that reason. Um, I, I'd love further discussion on it being universal and it being uh, an income and what basic means. So I'd be really interested to see what people think uh, is basic. Um, because basic is about meeting uh, the, the needs that we all have to live on, food uh, and uh, other additional needs. And, and we, you know, we have to really be realistic in that. Um, the area where I'd love, you know, kind of maybe to challenge on a little bit is that I do actually believe that the other universal benefits of pension and child benefits should be included 
which actually then puts up the pushes up the options of us being able to uh, increase the uh, the payments, which would obviously be more for children with uh, families with children and 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 for older people. I wouldn't want any, and I'm sure none of us would want any uh, possible drop in those levels. Um, I. I I have real reservations about it running alongside universal credit, um, which for me is an absolute abomination. And I, I think we should come out and say that and just be really clear that this is a system we do not want to run alongside universal credit, we want it out. Um, but look, um, what I'd say to everybody is we are starting here and that is really positive. Please try and be constructive in your comments Please try and see that as, as the Liberal Democrats, we are pushing forward an agenda here, which has never been pushed forward this far before. Uh, and don't forget that Anirin Bevan, who happened also to be from Wales, um, went and took the, the, the concept of the NHS to the government and had it pushed back on 21 occasions. And on 10 occasions, even doctors voted down the idea of the NHS. So this is not a, a short, sharp sprint. I don't either. I want it to be somewhere in the middle. But we, we absolutely need to have this discussion. And please, please think about what you can constructively suggest. Think about what evidence you can present. Let's do this in a truly liberal democrat way, which is loving, kind and fluffy. That's all I'll say. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, look forward to the discussion, the consultation and to this coming back in the autumn. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jane. I think I, I was waiting for a loving, kind and firm uh, at the end of that, but, but <laughs> fluffy, fluffy. OK, um, you also you also brought us in the direction of, of the NHS uh, reference, which I I'm sure will be popular with Christine. who I, th I think, Christine, the first time I came across the, the, the framing of our generation's NHS was in your words. Um, so let's uh, let's come to you, Christine, and, and hear your your first responses. Yeah, I, I think um, when I first started talking about this, I also have to apologise to Paul, of course, because I was a GWP sp spokesperson, what, two years ago, three years ago now, when we discussed this originally went, no, I don't know, I don't know. Um, and then not long after that thought, oh, I got that wrong. Um, for the reasons that Jane has just laid out, we do need something transformational and we needed, especially since... Um, the, the pandemic, in the first two or three months of the pandemic, it became absolutely clear that the universal credit system, which we all knew was flawed, deeply flawed, we discovered was fatally flawed, and that we had no safety net for millions of people in this country. So it became absolutely essential. And one of the things that we have found on the cross-party group is that there is agreement above all else on the need to replace what we have with something which is fit for the 21st century and the change in society. Um, two things, first of all, Paul, that's your apology. <laughs> and thank you for all the work that you've done in this, because as Jane says, it will be huge. I know I come out every Every week I come out of the, U, uh, the UBI, I'm not going to go into all the cross-party parliamentary local government, all the Gs. I come out with my head spinning because there is just that one thing that everybody agrees on because it's such a complex thing. But gradually everybody is coming around to, well, that would be too far. It, we'd like to do it, but we couldn't. And so I now firmly believe that UBI is going to happen. Um, the Scottish government, like the Welsh government, are also committed to a UBI. And all the parties in Scotland, well, not all the parties, most of the parties in Scotland, are now pushing for Scotland to be trial, the base for the trial by a U, for a UK system. Um, so I don't know what will happen with that. On the proposals themselves, yes, I agree with Jane. We're going to have discussions. We'll go back and forward. Some people will think it's not enough. Some people will think it's too much. Uh, but we will find a way. We will... We will... Oh, am I allowed to quote Jess Phillips? Is that acceptable this evening? I think you've already done yourself the damage if you if you stop now, so you may as yeah, well. Yeah, I might as well. When we... Um, 
when the domestic abuse bill was passed in Parliament, it had only taken four years. But one of the significant things about the domestic abuse bill was, like UBI, there was a cross-party feeling that something had to be done, everything was wrong, and, you know, we didn't agree on all aspects of it, and there were long arguments and debates and four years of them. But Jess said in the final debate, this is legislation which has been forged by cross-party debate, disagreement and compromise. And I think that's what we will now have within the party, first of all, and then within the country about UBI. Small points, personally, I like the idea of keeping the allowance up and, and having a negative, um, negative income tax alike. Um, but I do think that what we have to do now is discuss, we have for the first time a concrete proposal, which we can now discuss, take forward, build on its strengths and see where we can find consensus in the party, which we will. Um, and I would just like to thank Jane because as well as congratulating her, it's the first time I've been called fluffy in a very long time. So, so thank you for that. And thank you, Paul, for this. Um, and um, let's get started talking about it. Good stuff. Thank you, Christine. Great stuff. Uh, I'm going to bring in Max now. So Max, uh, Max, who is president and co-founder of the, of the UBI Centre, as I mentioned at the start, we've been working, uh, we as the Social Liberal Forum Commission, Max and his team, actually, to, to do some work on, on what, we, what we between us came to call a, a blank slate UBI, a kind of, a, as a way of uh, sort of stepping back from the existing systems almost completely and, and as a way of, of provoking this conversation and providing some stimulus into it. Really, I think, Max, from the perspective of saying, like, let's keep our eyes on what's possible, not just where we're starting from. And, I, and so it'd be lovely to hear you kind of speak a little bit to that. We'll make sure the link goes in the chat again. Uh, email's gone out. I would recommend people have a look at this, uh, this bit of work. And, and Max, like, share, share, your, share your take with us. Yeah, thank you, John. And uh, thank you to the Social Liberal Forum for hosting this, all the other panelists and everyone in the audience. Um, it's just been really impressive to see what is happening on UBI in the UK. And I know you've all been making it happen. So it's an honor to be joining you today. Um, a little bit of background. So UBI Center, we are a think tank. We research UBI policies. Um, in particular, we look at the policy simulation angle. So some of the things that Paul was showing on the screen, we would sort of look into how much could a UBI cost of different flavors? How could you fund that? What would be the distributional impacts of different kinds of designs? Um, so we've really mostly worked in the US context so far, but over the past year or so, we've really grown our UK team. And a few months ago, as John mentioned, we started working with SLF on modeling a, a more generous UBI to complement the incremental reforms that some others have done modeling over. Um, and that culminated in the report that we launched earlier today, which is called Blank Slate UBI, a constructive challenge for the UK basic income debate. Um, so yeah, really grateful to Social Liberal Forum for working on that with us. Um, also, I'll, I'll mention my co-authors, Nikhil Woodruff, Deepak Singh, and Charles Bauman. Um, so this is really rooted in the idea that as we've all been talking about today, of the real deficiencies of the existing system. So. Um, there are th some things that can be easily amended, and I really applaud the Lib Dems for working on that. Repealing the sanction system, repealing the benefit caps. Um, these will reduce poverty kind of immediately, and they also move us in a direction of UBI. UBI is about unconditional cash transfers that are universal. This moves us in that direction. Um, also, I think more resourcing on wait times would help, uh, aside from UBI. But some of these programs, there's inevitable uh, issues with them. If they're condition-based, um, if they're means-tested, things like underpayments, overpayments, can't really get around that as long as you have a means-tested program where people are expected to report any, any change to their income uh, throughout their whole career. Um, things like the 75% marginal tax rate on universal credit, that is, uh, you know, it happens basically everywhere where you, where you have uh, means-tested programs. You're going to just have benefits that stack on top of each other. And people are paying tax twice, right? They're paying tax through the normal tax system, and then they're paying tax through the withdrawal of the benefit system. Um, other problems like the asset limit on universal credit, um, a very common kind of approach 
in means tested programs that has not only discouraged savings for, for years, but it also results in people not receiving the benefits that they might have been expecting, especially in surprise economic catastrophes like the pandemic. So we took a different approach. We, um, we really focused on a generous UBI, something about 140 pounds per week. Um, and this is very costly. <laughs> so uh, we did uh, some of the costings like, like Paul shared. Um, you know, it costs about 500 billion pounds to do a, a UBI at that level. But it does enable you to move a, away from the existing system and the flaws. If we were starting fresh, I think this could be the kind of amount that you, you might consider. Um, so the way we funded it was because it is quite expensive, it really requires audacious changes. So we removed all means tested benefits, uh, pretty much all of them, and we replaced the existing income tax code and national insurance with a 50% income tax. Um, so that sounds kind of conservative, those two things, but the results really speak for themselves. So uh, you reduce poverty by over 30%, you reduce inequality by almost 10%, you basically eradicate deep poverty, so people living below half the poverty line. Um, and also most people come out ahead, about 58% of the population would come out ahead. Um, I think one really important piece here is reducing child poverty. There's just so much empirical basis that child poverty produces long-term negative outcomes in terms of education, health, mental health we've talked about, career prospects, even life expectancy has, um, is related to whether you grow up in poverty or not. Um, and I should say, actually, I didn't mention, so it's 140 pounds per week on average. Uh, I encourage you to read the report, but basically we split it by age group. So kids, we gave 65 pounds about per week, adults about 140, and pensioners about 210. And we also introduced a supplement for people with disabilities about 80 pounds per week. And we also tried some, there was some chat about regional variation, so we tried some stuff there too. Um, you know, so I think there's the direct distributional benefits of something like this in terms of poverty inequality. There's also the reduced marginal tax rates on the poor for people who are currently getting withdrawal rates of above 50%. Um, it creates a sense of transparency. It's a very simple kind of idea. You have half your income and the government basically you share with your um, fellow citizens the rest of the other half of your income. And that's through existing government programs as well as UBI. Of course, um, you know, others here on this call are taking the political risks. So um, we're the ones just focused on the policy impacts and trying to empower advocates as well as politicians to understand the real trade-offs um, in some of these ideas. There's a lot more research directions. I think they're all productive. I really applaud other uh, groups have done modeling in the UK. Um, there's been some discussion in the chat about carbon taxes and land value taxes. So those are other directions we'd like to consider. I think those would produce a more generous UBI as well as having other benefits for the environment and things like that. Um, so we're gonna, you know, this is just the beginning for us. We're looking forward to hearing from the rest of you, working with you on a sustained basis to research both the incremental side and the aspirational side in the UBI direction. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Thanks very much for that, Max. And, and just to say, like, I, I think I'm working a little bit with you guys on that report and, uh, to, and, and just understanding some of what you're saying, that the, 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 the challenges you make, I think, uh, are very helpful. And, and particularly that this, this notion of, 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 of having a clearly defined kind of social contract, whether we, can, whether we can sort of here and now and from this moment in time say, I, I earn half and, and I give the, and, and the other half is collective might be a bit of a might be a bit of a shift but equally sort of that that clarity of social contract i think is a really interesting thing for us to engage with as a as a, as a sort of a principle and a philosophy of what we're doing folks i'm going to i'm going to shut the poll, close the poll in just a moment so you have a few more seconds just while i uh, while i tap dance just to, to cast then cast your votes if you're in, and answer the poll if you haven't already and then I'm going to end the poll and we're going to um, see, see what the numbers come back as. And then, and then we might come back to Paul, if I may, and, and, and maybe the rest of the panel just for some, for some sort of any, any more reflections uh, on, on where things are, where we're at. So I am now going to close the poll. Uh, and I think that should mean that I can share the results. Uh, so view, you should be viewing these results now, I believe. 
So uh, in first point, overall, I'm feeling positive about the proposed GBI policy at, at present. 64% uh, saying yes. Uh, so Paul can breathe a sigh of relief. He's 14% uh, <laughs> uh, no, saying no. 20% quite fairly saying they might don't know yet and might need to actually read the paper. Uh, the level of ambition in the policy proposals is 7% say too high or unrealistic, 43% saying about right, 34% uh, saying not high enough and, and as ever, 16% quite rightly uh, taking their time. The costs are too high, similar number 8%, uh, about right 46, too low 11, don't know 35%. That's perhaps the thing that people need a bit more time to consider. And if I had to choose right now, very low interest in the £45 a week uh, seems broadly to match your, your own intuitions, Paul. So £60 a week and 60 75 95 there's, there's a broad spread of interest. Very few people saying none of the above and, and, and for all too high reasons and, and a, a decent proportion of people saying, saying maybe they're all a bit too low. So, that, I mean, folks, we're not saying this is scientific. This is, this is the beginning of a consultation phase rather than, rather than anything like the end of it and, and just a sort of toe in the water. But I, I think those are very interesting responses. Um, and, and, and maybe I'll come to, come to Paul for, for any reflections on, on those first responses he's heard, both, both from the panel and, from, and on that data. And, and just share some thoughts, Paul, on, on how, that, how, you're, how you feel in response to that, whether there's surprises there for you, and, and maybe where, where we go from here. Uh, sure, yeah, well, well, well thanks, John. I think, and that's, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure certainly, um, uh, I, think, I think the bulk of, of support in the group in terms of looking this, at this as an incremental process, I think if, I don't know who's a gambler and who's not on that group, but I think 60 to 75 pounds, one of those two feels about, about where we had landed as a group. So, and that was one of the reasons for putting forward the four sort of illustrations of what, you, what we could do. Um, so, so I think that's quite pleasing and that's almost, it's like 50-50 on who wants to be a millionaire, isn't it? So that, that obviously we'll see what else comes in, but that's, that's, quite, that's quite helpful. Um, I, I wondered, um, I mean, I think just to touch on some of the things that, that, that um, other speakers have said this evening, I think, and just some of, the, some of the stuff that's come up in the chat, I mean, certainly like Christine uh, and, and in chairing a fair share for all, uh, I must say I was not a convert until UBI until about six months after we'd all adopted UBI as a policy and even more so during a pandemic. So, um, you know, my, my current day job is, is working for a youth homelessness charity. So housing and benefits I'm sort of absolutely passionate about, but you kind of see the real world application of it when it goes wrong. So, you know, I'm absolutely sympathetic to, to all those in the chat and perhaps those people who want to maybe see us go further faster. So I, I absolutely get that. Um, uh, I, you know, as a, um, I think a few people have talked about housing costs and, you know, it's really great to hear Jane and I think other people reflecting that because housing costs are so variable, it, it, it's, it's not only more sellable because it would be crazy to make this sort of, you should get the same in London as you get in, you know, Newcastle or wherever it might be. Um, so I think, I think there's some, um, I hope, validation and that shared more broadly in the party and those who've talked about housing in the chat, um, uh, you know, as far as I'm aware, the party is not about to move away from its position. Uh, and if it did, it would only be to be more ambitious around that 300,000 homes a year level, uh, many, many of whom would be social housing, because obviously, if we're putting the money into bricks, we don't have to put it into any sort of benefit whatsoever. So that's a really positive thing. And, and, and people should be reassured that, that all of the volumes of policy we've got don't get uh, superseded by this, they get complemented by this policy if it's adopted in, in September. Um, I think the child benefits are really interesting discussion. Um, you know, we've got some fantastic members, including former parliamentary candidates on the working group. And they've sort of talked about their experience of knocking on doors, uh, experiences of people they know uh, around um, actually is the best way to tackle child poverty to keep putting money into child benefit. The answer may well be yes, but also we need to continue to fund our schools to tackle those problems we've had around homeschooling, uh, broadband connections, all of those things in the round. So again, just to kind of keep our remit focused in this, we've not touched on that, but we're very aware that in talking about levels and investment in a UBI, uh, it's not just necessarily benefits that can tackle child poverty, but as we know, frankly, from previous governments of 20, 25 years ago, it's a way to make a big impact quickly. 
Um, as I mentioned, the pensions dilemma is a really interesting one. Obviously, it's not really done on an individual basis if you're living as a pensioner couple. And uh, there's a price tag to that, but I think it's something the party should look seriously at as we start sort of racking up the costs in other areas. But I, I completely have sympathy and I think it fits logically with the universal basic income being an individual and not a household benefit. Uh, someone asked uh, for reference um, what the level in Finland in the trial was. Uh, from memory, I think it was about £120 a week, so not far off the sort of £60 UBI plus um, £94 universal credit example that I put on the slides earlier. So there seems to be some sense of, depending on the exchange rate with the euro, it's about where that is, certainly between that £60 and £75, so more grist to the mill. Um, and I think two further things, although as someone that once upon a time worked for Simon Hughes, I always think I should say at least 17thly at some point. Uh, but two more things. One is UBI, and I think it's most forgotten, but did uh, I forget now who touched upon it, uh, and it may have been in the chat actually. UBI really works for self-employed people, and Christine will know from casework, we will know from experiences of friends and family that if you've been self-employed during the pandemic, it has been a nightmare. And, and Ed and Christine and other colleagues in Westminster have really, really made a big um, stand for people in that situation. And I think that, again, that was reflected in the polls last Thursday. Um, and I think just to finish on the universal credit point, um, someone had put again in the chat, it's a, it's, a, it's a point of transition we would be into in the first five years, in the first parliament of a Lib Dem government. And... I have a lot of sympathy, and it was really discussed in a fairer share for all was, can you fix universal credit? And if you take the view that you can fix universal credit, um, should we call it something else? And there's a variety range of policies, and we haven't asked a specific question, but I think if people in the party maybe wanted to make some suggestions around that, uh, I'm sure it's the sort of things that our colleagues in Great George Street and around the country may well really resonate with that universal credit is a broken brand and why put something as innovative and radical as a UBI up against something that a lot of people dislike. Um, and, and finally, as Simon probably would say, often not, is uh, Max, thank you particularly for the work that your group has done. And I think at the beginning, I started talking about Beveridge and Asquith and Lloyd George and everyone that came in between in the early part of the 20th century could not have contemplated how complex the benefit system has got now. And I think there is a real feeling of actually by getting to that higher level of UBI over 10 years, 15 years, you could really get as close to possible as kind of blowing up the system and starting again. And I think Max has really challenged the group and has challenged us this evening to think about what is possible. And once you've got something established, what is politically achievable and what you can sell on the doorstep. And I think, you know, there are people who are maybe better at selling things and the marketing bit of it, but uh, I think we've kind of reached a good balance. But, you know, really appreciate all of the feedback this evening and, and, and you know, particularly from members as well as, as fellow speakers. Thanks for that, Paul. And I think that just to share a couple of reflections myself and then maybe leave a bit of space for Jane and Christine and Max to, 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 to offer any last reflections before we before we close. I think it feels to me a little bit that I, I, I was lucky enough that so this is one of a sequence of three events that have taken place over the course of the spring that uh, we as Social Liberal Forum have been holding in partnership with Lib Dems Basic Income and with the Basic Income Conversation, which is the, the sort of compass back sort of conversation holder uh, organisation. And, and the, the second of the first of those was how to win with basic income and, and resulted in generating some pretty flourishing ideas that went, in, went into Jane's campaign in particular, um, and, and including a set of, set of pretty wonderful 10 minute uh, podcast interviews where, where Jane interviews some, some, some of the real people. Uh, about what it might affect and, and Jane you might want to say a word about that in a moment but the second is the one that has been sort of coming back to me tonight which was a, an event with Michael Tubbs the mayor of Stockton in California uh, who, who uh, sort of was born to a to a mother who was still in high school and her father was already in prison and, and managed to sort of fight to become a councillor at the age of 22 and mayor of Stockton at the age of 26 and, in, and introduced a basic income actually only at the level of, I think, $500 a month, so sort of significantly lower, actually, than some of these proposals. And, and, and Tubbs was, um, he goes by Tubbs, apparently. Uh, Tubbs was, it was, was among other, he had a couple of really punchy things, and I would encourage people to watch the, um, 
watch this into watch this sort of session it was it was probably one of the most profound sort of hour hour or so of my life i, I was fortunate enough to be a conversant and two two of the things we talked about one one was language and and framing and and really getting this right and 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 the power so in stockton they called it seed the stockton economic empowerment demonstration and there's a sort of real punch to that and and, and i think there's like we can underestimate these things they, they they really do matter and i think that that illusion you just made to us of credit and is is an interesting one uh, tubbs now run, leads and runs an organization called mayors for a guaranteed income uh, and so they they they're working with this language of guaranteed income and they and they're, they're piling up commitments to this in the states there's now 50 mayors of american cities committed to implementing basic income of some sort or another which is just quite a phenomenal thing to bring into this space and, and this this conversation of that is it politically viable yes uh and, the, and and then the second thing actually slight, slightly at a kind of in a different angle that he said was he talked about um we are, he was asked about sort of getting started with this and and it and it comes back to the and he he had this very powerful phrase he said um he, he said some wonderful things he had this whole thing of like there's a that you where basic income comes from is a different kind of common sense that's about like believing that people will only do stuff if they feel safe and hopeful rather than believing that people will only do stuff if there's someone standing over them watching them which is but but the last thing he said was this thing about um purity and and he said um and I, I, I'm holding it now as I think about my own personal response to these proposals. It's like he said, he said, um, he said, purity is a luxury, is a luxury of the affluent, um, and like, and and he was like, you got to, you got to start, and you got to find the way you can start, and then you start. And 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 I think it makes me think of like he's a, a slightly less lyrical Paddy Ashdown. That Paddy Ashdown, slightly less lyrical, kind of every step towards a basic income liberates power in the hands of the citizen. And I think. That, that's sort of where, just to offer some reflections from me and where I'm sitting and, and, and those experiences I've had in the course of these these events. I, we've got a, just a couple of minutes left. We can we can wrap up a little early, but I'm, I'm also keen to just give Jane and Christine and Max the chance to sort of give a give a last word and, and maybe particularly Jane with your with the role you've played over over the last few months. Yeah, no, thanks very much. And Paul, once again, thank you. And please pass on our thanks to your working group and, and your work continues. I know it's uh, it's going to be relentless. Uh, so thank you very much, dear Marianne. And um, three things, really. Uh, the first is that I have been doing some podcasts with people across Wales, uh, lots of different people um, in terms of people who are students, people who are, you know, living in poverty, uh, you know, single parents, uh, older people, students, and we've been talking about what does a universal basic income mean to them. And I'd encourage you all, if you are candidates or if you're thinking of uh, how is it going to affect people, maybe outside of the Liberal Democrat bubble, and there is a world out there, then please do think about talking to other people. And if, if they're prepared to video it or, or whatever, it is really powerful. Um, and you know, it, it is important that we do that. We really relate to people who, who we want to affect and whose lives we want to change. That's the first thing. The second is um, we have to have this credible. We cannot have a, an unrealistic model here. Um, you know, the Liberal Democrats need to be evidence-based and people are saying, what's the point? Because we'll never be in government. Well, look, we are pushing the envelope we really are and look at me i mean i, I you know i've been elected to the senate and um i know conversations have been going on in wales and with mark drakeford for a while and those conversations have happened sometimes with me and sometimes without but this is about pushing people forward and i'm convinced that if we can demonstrate we're credible and we've got a really good model then we can really achieve this the third thing is um it is about having those conversations in the Senate campaign. I don't know how many interviews I had where people said this is ridiculous. The media said absolutely the stupidest thing we've ever heard in our life. And it was a bit like Arnie Vinnick in series seven of the West Wing when he stands in front of the crowd of people asking him about the nuclear power station. If any of you know that um, you just keep on at it and people then go, oh, OK, yeah, that makes sense. So don't give up. Just keep having a polite, respectful conversation and put your ideas forward. Thank you. Very good. Folks, I'm going to 
Christine, would you, is there anything you like that? You're good. Uh, folks, I'm going to close this up just, just by sharing a few of the next steps. If uh, Just to say, uh, the, the questions from, from you, uh, this is, when, I think if we opened up questions, we'd get, we'd get in all sorts of places. And, and, and this is more of a sort of opening of the thing. Those, the questions give you a chance to dig into the document and, and once, it's, once it's published. So just to say, on terms of the process on the consultation, the, the, the document is not yet live. Uh, it, it was supposed to be, but it hasn't yet been published. As soon as it is published, it will be sent out uh, to all of you who've attended this event and the SLF will promote it, the party will promote it, but it, the, the, it is not yet live to be clear. When it, as soon as it is live, which should be in the next day or two, we understand, uh, then, then it will be open until the 30th of May. And there, will be, there are multiple layers of question to, 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 to give you an opportunity to feed in. In the meantime, uh, I would say a few things. Firstly, um, there's, uh, um, we've been working with uh, the, the sort of internal party cam in, uh, a campaign group that's internal to the party called, uh, called Lib Dems for Basic Income. Uh, they are, we, I'm involved in that too, alongside Jane and others, uh, are, are mainly organising through a WhatsApp group, uh, and I'll post the link to that in the chat. Uh, and if you want to want to be part of that, then then you can you, you can uh, you can you can join that uh, and and stay 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 close to that work. Uh, I would like to say that the Social Liberal Forum we are entirely run by volunteers. There is there is uh, and, and we run entirely on donations and, and the efforts and time of, of us as a volunteer team. If you've enjoyed tonight, then please do consider making a donation. Uh, please do consider joining the SLF. We're, 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 we're developing some really interesting agendas and, and trying to work in a really constructive but, but challenging way with the party. Uh, and we'd love to have you as part of that. Uh, and and as a last uh, as a last word, I'd just say remember, and I've said it twice already, but but the, that that phrase, every step we take towards a basic income is going to liberate power in the hands of the citizen, and that's that's really what our party, I think, and and lots of nods from the panel is all about. So let's get behind this. Let's let's make it as strong as we can. There'll be the consultation period, then there'll be a a policy proposal to conference, that, and that will be open to amendments as well. But if we all get behind this, get this through, uh, give ourselves a really strong starting point that we can get on the doorsteps with, get ourselves into, into some power uh, by, way of, uh, by way of making making some other parties perform a little bit better as well. Uh, and then we can, uh, we can make this country an awful lot better a place to be for a lot of people. So thank you for joining this evening. Uh, and uh, we will see you again very soon, hopefully, on, on something from the Social Liberal Forum or elsewhere. Thanks very much.